All right, so we're at uh, 7.03 Eastern. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, and welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me on today's Sunday for this tech and talk um, about the command line tips and tricks. Um, I'm really excited to give this to you all because I feel like when I was going to launch school, the command line was something that was very mysterious and had a lot of uh, kind of like black magic involved that um, really made things kind of be curious what's going on when you're using the command line. And since uh, starting to work at DigitalOcean full time, um, I've actually used the command line a lot more and learned a bunch. And I thought I'd bring some of that to you all. Um, I also um, asked in Slack if there's any topics that people wanted me to cover. Um, and I did add some of them to the presentation. Um, I'm not going to be able to cover everything that was asked. It was just too much. But there's the chance of maybe a part two in a little while for all the advanced stuff that people asked. Um, Throughout this presentation, I'm going to switch from the presentation to my terminal, just so that you all can kind of see in real time kind of how some of these commands look and operate. Um, and there'll be time at the end for questions, but I'm also gonna open up that because there's a lot of things we're gonna cover, if you have a question in the moment on something like a slide, um, feel free to ask. I can pause for a couple seconds, see if there's any questions, and then I'll move on to the next topic but let's go ahead and get started. So command line tips and tricks. And we're gonna start with what this talk will cover. And basically these are, these are all the topics. Um, we're gonna talk about the shell and the different kinds of shells. We're gonna talk about the path, um, environment variables, dot files, aliases, um, and then some of my favorite commands that I use all the time, um, such as less cat, bat, z, and so forth. Um, yes, these slides will be posted and this talk is also recorded. Um, we're going to go through grep and rip grep, uh, input output redirection, pipes, listing processes, and killing them. And then we're going to delve into two kind of workflow tools that I use all the time for t called tmux and vim. Now, what I won't be able to cover today um, are, is bash scripting, which you should all check out the new 170 networking course because it does have an introduction to bash scripting and it'll be an excellent introduction to it. Um, I'm not gonna be able to cover background or cron jobs, which is something that was requested, but it's something that I don't really see many students using during launch school, um, but maybe in their professional job. Awk and said was asked for. That could be a tech talk on its own, so I'm not gonna be covering those things. Um, file permissions is another thing that I don't feel many students use during the course, uh, the courses. So I'm not going to be able to cover that. And xargs, which was a command that was requested in Slack. But don't worry, um, I have resources at the end of the presentation that will give you a chance to learn all about these on your own. And some of these things may be in a part two presentation. So don't uh, be worried that I don't cover them today. So we're going to start with the shell. And um, for a lot of people, they wonder kind of what is the shell that we use? Um, and the shell is simply just a program that takes keyboard commands and passes them to your operating system to execute. That's really all that it is. Um, and when, usually when I'm talking about the shell and the command line, it's pretty much synonymous with what I'm talking about. It's just uh, this black box that we're all familiar with to, op to work with our computer um, in a way that's deeper and we have more control over than uh, before we started launch school. Um, almost all Linux distributions come with the bash shell installed um, and that also includes Mac OS. So if you have a MacBook, then you have bash installed by default. Um, and there are other shell options out there. Um, and some people wonder, okay, what is the benefit of using these different shells? What am I getting out of it? So the couple of the more popular options out there besides Bash is the Fish shell, which um, has a few features that Bash doesn't come with automatically, such as uh, intelligent auto-completion. It has some syntax highlighting out of the box. Um, and there's quite a few other things um, that come with it um, that make it a favorite for a lot of people. I've included a, the GitHub here for the Fish shell that goes more into detail about it if you want to try it out. And then another shell that's um, very popular is Zish. And the reason that Zish is so popular for developers is that there's a big community that creates plugins, themes, and features 
for Zish, one of the biggest ones called Oh My Zish. And there's a link here for kind of how you can um, customize your Zish shell to make it as colorful and as unique as you want. But the one thing I want to emphasize here with the shell program and all these different flavors is that at the core, they're going to do the same thing. They're going to let you have greater control over your computer. They're going to execute the same commands. And it's really more just kind of what features you want by default with your shell or what features you want to add. Um, and it really just comes down to it. I, so far, I'm pretty happy with just the bash shell. But feel free to check out and explore what you want. And you can always hop back and forth between them. You can get Zish, try it out for a while, realize maybe you don't want it, just hop back to Bash, and everything will still be fine. Um, you're still going to have all of your files and everything because it's on your computer. The shell is just a way to access everything and have control. And so that's the shell. Do you have any questions before I move on? All right, I'm going to move on to the next one. So next we have the path. And the path is one of the uh, topics that was requested in the Slack. And the path is an environment variable for your shell and can be modified at any time. And we're going to cover environment variables in a second. But essentially, um, what this path is, is a list of directories that your shell will search to find commands to execute. You can always see your path by typing echo dollar sign path, which I'll show you in a second. And so the reason why there's a path is that your shell needs to know where the commands you want to execute exist. And so when you type cd dot dot to jump up a directory and just move around your file system, well, cd is actually a file somewhere in your computer. And your shell needs to know where it can find it so it can execute it. And the way it finds it is checking the path. It'll search all the directories in your path. And if it can't find the CD command anywhere in your path, then it's going to spit back command not found. And then that's where you run into the next step of if you have a command that you've downloaded, but it's not accessible, you have to add it to your path. And um, in fact, most of the commands that come with your shell are in the bin folder. So let me show you what this looks like. So here we have my terminal. And if we just echo, path, you'll see this is my path. These are all of the directories I have um, put in my path that my shell will search for uh, commands. And they're all separated by this colon. So you see we have this directory, and then this directory, and then this directory, and then this directory. It's all just different directories. that are colon separated. And they just give your shell a path that's where the name comes from, to find the commands you're searching for. And if you ever need to add something to your path, um, then you can simply um, you know, modify your path, and then um, it'll add it to it. And the way you can modify it um, is with a dot file. And we'll cover that in just a second. Um, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but just have in your mind what the path is. And when we get to dot files, I'll tell you how you can change it. So any questions with the path right now? All right, I don't see anything. All right, so like I said, um, you can modify your path. Um, and all you have to do is uh, you know, um, just type path equals path, and then the new folder you want to add, and then you have to export it. Um, and when you export your path, you're basically just saving it to your shell. Because if you just do this first part, which is path equal dollar sign path colon folder, then your shell will remember it. But when you close your terminal, you close your shell, then it forgets it. But to make sure that it remembers it the next time you open your terminal, you have to have done export path. Um, if you ever want to remove a folder from your path, then you actually need to open this dot file. And that's what we're going to talk about right now. So with bash, you have a dot bash profile file, and that will store everything that sets your shell, and then um, it sets all of your settings. So um, you can do the dot uh, underscore profile. Um, I actually made a mistake here. This should be profile. And we can see what that looks like. 
So if I just say vim uh, dot bash profile, here's my dot bash profile file. It has all these things I've customized for my shell. We're not going to worry too much about most of them, but here you can see this. This is my path. If I ever wanted to remove something from here, I can just delete it and then um, save the file and it's gone from my path. And if you ever want to add something back, you can also just edit the file. And so here you can see that I've just added a bunch of folks to it. And so that is the path. And so now we're going to cover environment variables. And environment variables, um, like I said, and the path is one of them, are just settings for your shell that are stored and built every time you start a new shell session, every time you um, open your shell um, program, your terminal. Um, the environment variables are used to pass information into processes running in your shell. And you can see them at any time by running print env or env in your shell. A lot of common things in your environment are shell, user, path, home. And at the end of the day, you're not really going to modify these variables very much while you're at launch school. A lot of the things that you're doing um, aren't going to require that. But later on, when you have your full-time job and you have to work with different kind of processes, you might end up modifying some of these. And so if we go here into my terminal again, I just typed env, and I, we can see everything that is an environment variable that's saved in my terminal. These are all the settings that are there um, for my terminal um, whenever I need it. And as you can see, here's that path, that environment variable. Once again, you won't need to worry about this too much um, for now at launch school, but it's just something to kind of be aware of for later on when you do have to modify some of this. I think there's a question in Q&A. Right. Um, Melissa says, when you ran echo under uh, dollar sign path, it looked like there were more directories than were just in that file you showed. Um, that is true. Um, and the reason why is that um, when you do echo path, it does show a bunch of them here. But if I actually look at the profile, then you see that the path isn't that long. Um, and the reason why is that it's these dollar sign capital letter um, things right here, like dollar sign go path, dollar sign home, and so forth. Um, the dollar sign ones are basically just variables that um, are as uh, assigned those longer um, those longer folder names. So if you look at this, I have home scripts IPAM. And if we look at the path here, there's scripts IPAM, but then there's users J Zerwick. So really, um, it's not something to really get hung up on right now. Um, but all it is is just that these are the full directory names, like from the home the, uh, folder in your computer all the way to where the folder is. Whereas in the profile, it's just kind of shortened because I've saved some of those longer pieces to some variables. So don't worry too much about that. But that's just kind of what's going on there. Um, OK. So let's get back to the presentation. Um, so yeah, so we've, that's environment variables. Uh, cool. Um, now we're going to talk about dot files. And we've already kind of touched a little bit on dot files um, with the bash profile uh, file. And essentially, dot files are pretty much what they sound like. They're files that start with a period. Um, there's all kinds of them. There's bash rc, there's bash profile, there's vimrc, there's all kinds of them. And they're usually hidden from you when you type ls in your terminal. Um, but if you pass dash a with ls, then it'll show all your hidden files. So dash a stands for all. And so you can see that here that if I just do dash A, we can see those hidden dot files. And the reason they're hidden is because dot files are for configuration. And unless you're editing them all the time or you know, just trying to customize things, there's not really a real reason to see them all the time when you type ls. So they're hidden for that matter. Um, and so I've already shown you my bash profile file. 
And that's where I kind of customize a lot of things. And we're going to dive deeper into that file in just a second. But just to you're aware, um, with the bash shell, you can have settings in .bash profile, in .bash rc. Um, I personally have a bunch of things um, in my .bash profile. And um, a neat thing that many developers do when they get into configuring a lot of different programs in these dot .files is they will actually create a GitHub repo of their dot .files and save them. And the reason why is that if ever their computer breaks, then they can just get a new computer, download the repo, and be all set up with all their configurations in no time. Um, and so that's actually um, one of the ways to kind of just like use these dot .files and uh, configurations and just make sure that uh, you can quickly ramp up a new computer to make it yours again. Now, kind of as a caveat to this though, is that when you use Git, the program to save your file changes and load them up to a repo on GitHub, Git doesn't actually track dot .files by default. It doesn't want to track all these configurations because sometimes developers have um, like credentials or things that are sensitive information in dot .files that you don't want up on a public repo that anyone can see. So Git doesn't track dot .files um, on their, um, by default. So then how do we actually get these dot .files that we do want to store in a repo and actually make sure we can store them? And that's when we have a handy new feature called a symbolic link. And what this feature does is that it allows you to create a, a file that's linked to another file. And um, it can have a different name, but they have the same contents. And so if we actually, um, I'm going to hop out of this folder. I'm in now my, um, my home directory. Um, and if you see, right uh, here, we have dot bash rc. And that has a little at symbol behind next to it. Um, the at symbol is showing up because I kind of did some customizations to show it. But this is showing that I've made an actual system, a symbolic link to this file. And it actually, it is linked to go to my tech talk, let's go to dot files, let's go to my bash folder. And boom, right there, I have an actual file called my bash RC, my bash profile. And if you look at it, those are all the contents I showed you before. It's exactly the same. And that's how we can kind of store dot .files and put them in a repo and push them to GitHub. Um, and the way that we actually create them is with this ln command, dot .s, we type the file that we want, and then we link it to another file. And so that's what I've done here. I've taken my bash rc file for my dot .files, and I'm linking it to this dot .file. And there, it's all set up. I can push this dot .files command to GitHub, and everything's there. And that's kind of how we go about that. Um, I have a link I can post that shows a more in-depth on how developers go through this dot file. I actually didn't add it to the presentation, but I will uh, post it um, and add it um, once the presentation is done. Um, but this is really handy for when you start configuring things and you want to save it for um, something later on. Um, I know that was a lot. Is there any questions with dot files right now? Okay, so going to the next one. Aliases. Um, this is a really, um, really great feature of the shell that's going to save you a ton of time and a ton of typing. And it's something that you can start doing today to make the shell feel like your own. Um, and what aliases are is that they're a way to map long commands or even a string of them to a very short name. Um, it allows you to customize the way you work in your shell. and um, you can take hard to remember commands and replace them with a short command. All you have to do is go to your dot file, use the word alias, and define a short command. So one of the ones I've made is an alias named GPM, which will run git pool origin master. So whenever I want to pull some changes from my GitHub repo, I can just do GPM. 
Another one is dot dot. I've now made dot dot do the same thing as cd dot dot to go up a directory. And then here with a, another alias, this is actually something I do with DigitalOcean a lot. Um, and you don't need to really understand most of this. It's really just taking, using Docker to bring up a database to run tests for. But what I want to convey to you is look how long that command is. Docker run dash dash rm dash e mysql da 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 da. All this stuff that I would have to look up every single time to run this command or save it somewhere. I can just store it as an alias test container and then I can just run test container and it does the exact same thing. So aliases are a way to speed up your workflow and help you work effectively by mapping um, everything. And so if we go to here, I'm actually, um, let me show you. Look, I just did cd dot dot, but I can really just do dot dot. And it goes up a directory. Um, so bash profile. And here are all of my aliases that I've made. So I've made sublime read open this file with sublime text. Um, there's the CD again. Um, I did dot, 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 dot to make CD dot, dot twice. Um, I've changed, uh, I've made my ls command actually be ls dash acf. And that actually just basically means that anytime I type ls, I see all of the files and I can see whether they're a dot file or a directory and so on. There's git pull master or gmaster again. Um, and two ones that I use for work all the time. So it's really simple. You just have to go to a dot file and then just type alias, the short name you want to use, and then in double quotes, type out the command you want to replace, and you're good to go. And then you just have to save the file and then close your terminal and open a new one, and it's going to be taking effect. So that's a great thing about aliases and a way to really start customizing your shell at this point in time. Uh, any questions about aliases? Let's see. Oh, pretty neat. Yep, that's it's pretty awesome. All right. Uh, I don't think there's any in the Q and A. Okay. So now we're going to get into some commands. And one of my uh, two of my favorites um, for um, macOS is pb copy and pb paste. And they're essentially copy and paste commands for the command line. Um, they come by default with Mac OS, but you can install and set up similar commands for Linux at this link, um, which you can get from the slides later. And really, it just allows you to copy information from the command line without taking your hands away from the keyboard. Um, you can copy and paste file contents that may be difficult to accomplish with a mouse, such as SSH keys and paste them to an account. Um, and an example that I have here and we're going to dive into some of these a little bit later, is cat, which basically will show you the output of a file, pipe, which will then take that and give it to pbcopy. And now everything in that file is in my um, clipboard. And so let me show you kind of what that looks like. So we have uh, my files here. I can um, take my bash profile, and I can uh, feed it into pb. Uh, copy, and then I can do pb paste, and there's everything that was in my clipboard. It was all just there, and this is a really neat way to um, just like from the command line grab things without using your mouse. Um, it's also in your since it's in your clipboard, you can open a new file, and you can just paste, and it's right there. Um, just like command v. Um, and so forth. So that is a really neat feature that I use all the time, um, uh, every day with uh, just grabbing things from the command line. Um, and yeah, if you're running your uh, everything on Linux, then it's really easy to set these up yourself in this link. Any questions about PB copy, PB paste? Nope. Oh, wait, I see something. OK, so a question from Ryan about um, bash profile and bash RC, two dot files. What's the difference between the two of them? Are they interchangeable in some respects? That's something I should make clear, so thank you for asking about that. Um, so yeah, so I mentioned bash profile and bash RC. Um, 
And it's essentially two uh, dot files to configure your bash shell. Um, and at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter as far as I'm aware which one you use. Sometimes uh, your operating system will already have one and you can just start configuring. Sometimes you have to create one, um, but um, you don't, it's not actually like one does things that the other one um, doesn't, um, as far as I'm aware. Um, I'll have to, I can double check to make sure on that, but I've put some things in one, some things in the other. Um, and I can get back to you on which one is uh, the preferred, but they both do kind of the same thing. All right. Okay, let's get back. PB copy, PB paste. Uh, yeah, so it's okay to have some things going in both at the same time. You're not gonna run into any trouble. All right, so next we're gonna go over a new, another command called find. And find is a command that helps you search for and find files in your file system. So if ever you're working in a, um, you know, a folder that has a bunch of subdirectories and a bunch of files, and you're not quite too sure where a file exists, but you know the name of the file, you can use find to find it. Um, the syntax for using find is you type find, and then you say the path, and then the name. Uh, the name is just basically saying, I want to find something that whose name matches, and then you give the file name. And this will search all your subdirectories um, in the given path and below. So this is great for finding files in a large code base. Um, an example here is, you know, I have a to-do app and I want to find all my files that are end with RB, that are Ruby files. Um, well, find that you do that. You just use find. I'm gonna give it my to-do app, which is the topmost directory where everything's contained. I'm gonna say name because I want things to match this given name. And then I'm gonna say uh, asterisk.rb. And the asterisk, just to clarify any question that may come up, the asterisk just means any character. So the reason why we're using asterisk here is basically saying, I want any file that ends in .rb. And it will do that. It will find every file that ends in .rb. Um, so actually, let me go ahead and show that. I'm gonna hop over here. I'm gonna CD into Sinatra. I actually um, downloaded the repo for Sinatra for this reason. Um, for those of you who don't know, Sinatra is a um, framework for building web apps with Ruby. And I believe you start using it in 175 or 180 in Launch School. I can't quite remember the number. Um, but yeah, so we can go find, we can just use uh, this command. Um, obviously, it's not to do app. Um, it's uh, Sinatra. We're going to give it a different one. We can say, let's find everything in lib, my lib folder. Okay, there's nothing in there. Let me double check if I'm doing something wrong. Uh, okay, no. Let me go into, uh, let's see. I always say never demo in a presentation because something's gonna go wrong. And then I did a whole presentation where you demo something. So uh, let's see. Huh, okay, one sec. All right, well I'm gonna do something I know works. Okay. And we're gonna go for so this is a, another uh, directory. I'm saying everything in there, name. There it goes, it found it for me. Um, I could do that thing I was mentioning and finds all of them with the ending of .txt. So here you go, you can, I just found everything uh, with a specific name and just like that and I know where everything is. Um, and you can also do something that is a little dangerous for find, but if you're confident you can do that, you can use find to find and delete every file with a name. And so here we say find dot, which is the current directory, name matching, you know, anything with a dot txt, and I want to delete it. And so that's a quick way to do cleanup, but 
uh, it's a bit, it's a, it's a, if you're not careful, you can destroy more things than you actually intend to. Um, there's a great little tutorial about find on this link here um, if you want to learn more about using it. And I think we have a question in the chat. Uh, I don't, okay, I don't see any new questions. Okay. Um, anything about find before I move on? Okay. Um, I'm probably actually going to give room for questions at the end since I have only about like 10-ish more minutes until open Q&A. So um, from now on, that's just a whole questions till the end. Okay. Um, here's a neat little trick for when you are um, working in your shell and you want to use a command you've used before, um, you don't want to type it all out. You can actually search your shell history to find commands you've executed. And you can do that with just typing control R. So when you are in your shell and you type control R, it'll let you search back all the commands you've done and you can find it and then you can execute it. And so if we go into here, we can just say control R and I can just say, uh, let me see. Okay, I've done this find. That's not quite what I was doing. Okay, Sinatra, boom. And so you can see that I found it again. Another option we could do, um, see, cat, okay. T and dot that. yep, and there you go. And you can see that's how you can search commands you've done before um, very quickly. Um, another little bonus tip, if you want to use a command you've very, very recently uh, used, you can just type up on your arrow key and it'll show all the commands you've run. You can type down to go back down. And that's just really quick and easy if you mess up and you want to correctly, you want to correct something. So uh, I don't know, like I had just misspelled that. I can just type up and fix it. So neat little trick for going through all the commands you want to. Hmm. Gotcha, thanks Stephanie. Stephanie corrected my, uh, my, my mistake with using find before. So if you want to see how to actually do it, probably look at uh, the chat. Um, but yeah, that's uh, looking through all your commands. Next, we're going to go over viewing files with cat and less. So cat is a command that will output a file's contents in your terminal for you to see. All you have to do is type cat and then the file name. Um, now, this is cool. It's great. Uh, profile, but you're kind of left just scrolling up and down to look at the outputs, which isn't the most user friendly. So what we have, thankfully, is another command called less. And less is similar to cat, but you can actually interact and search through the file contents. So I can do less dot bash or C, sorry, bash uh, profile. And now you can see that I can, using the um, J and K keys, I can look up and down throughout the file. And with using the forward slash alias, it'll actually search the file and see anything I want. And this is just really great for if you want to just quickly look at a file. You don't want to have to open it with your text editor. And you just want to kind of reference it. If you want to exit, you just have to type Q. And I do this all the time to look at a file while I'm uh, typing something in another terminal. So that's cat and less. Um, and once you've used cat and less a little bit, a really great upgrade is a command you can download called bat. And bat is just like less, but it has syntax highlighting, it shows line numbers, and it will actually show recent changes that you've made to a file. So just to show you the same thing, here's the same file, but with bat. And you can see all of the syntax coloring, you can see the line numbers for where everything is. It's just kind of a nicer, more supercharged way of using less to um, kind of just go through everything and see a file. So this is something that I've added to my daily workflow and I've loved it ever since I got it. Uh, next, we're gonna go with Z. And Z is a nice uh, little tool you can download that is a supercharged way of jumping throughout your directories. 
basically Z allows you to hop from one directory to another without actually having to CD dot dot CD dot dot over and over and kind of navigate the tree one step at a time. And the way it works is that when you download Z, you still need to CD around a little bit because Z is building up a history of all your directories. And then after a little while, you can just type Z and it will take you there. So just to show you what it looks like, I can, before I would have had to do CD slash slash then go up to, I don't know, um, we would have to go to, if I was gonna work at DigitalOcean, we have a repo called Cthulhu, uh, Cthulhu and then this, and then SOC, and then DO code, and it just goes on and on forever until I finally get to a folder that I'm actually working on every day. With Z, I can just type the name, and boom, I'm there. That's all it is. It, it jumped, um, I think, at least uh, 10 folders to get me to where I want. And then I can jump all the way back to my tech talk. Let's see. Maybe it hasn't saved it yet. Nope, there it is. I jumped right back. So Z is awesome. Um, it's a very quick way to kind of just uh, navigate your entire file system. Um, and so I'd highly recommend that you start using it once you start getting, uh, building bigger and bigger projects with a ton of subdirectories and files. All right, next we have searching your code with grep. So grep is a command that allows you to search your code for a pattern in a given path. And the way it works is that you type grep, you type the expression, the pattern you want to find, and you give it a path. And so, say, let's say you're working on a file and you want to find, and you're working on this function. This function is called validate request. And this validate request can come up in a lot of different files in your code base. You want to find out every single place it is so that you can make sure that it, you know, it works and you know where, where it is. Um, well, if you want to just search one file for every instance of it, you type grep validate request the file. In the case, this case, the file is main.rb, and it's going to search that file for that uh, validate request. If you want to recursively search every subdirectory, then you can just type uh, the same thing, but dash r, meaning recursive, and then give it the path. And so let's say your project has an app folder that everything lives under. You type app slash asterisk, and it'll search everything in app. Um, if you want to get the same thing, but everything you want back, you want it to show every line number that that function lives on, you just have to add the end flag. And so if we can go into Sinatra, um, we can do, uh, actually, let me go back. And let me do grep. And I want to find, um, let's see, dot rb. Uh, let me renumber to do this dash nr. Uh, let's do uh, what do I want to find. I want to find, let's say, every class in it. And we can do Sinatra. And there you go. It shows you every single um, instance that the word class appears. So you can see that it gives you the location, the file, and even the line number that it is, that it exists on. Um, so this is a really neat way for you to kind of, when you're modifying something in your code base, and you wanna make sure that you've um, identified everywhere that it lives and you change it accordingly, this is a way to do that. Um, and so, I do this all the time at DO to just make sure that if I'm changing, let's say, the number of arguments that a function takes, or I'm adding some, I'm changing the name for whatever reason, then I make sure that I actually can find it in every single case and fix it before I run my tests and everything. Um, it's just a really nice feature. Um, so grep is awesome. And you can actually get a supercharged version of grep called ripgrep with this uh, sub, uh, this uh, GitHub. And ripgrep basically does the same thing, but you don't need to give it many flags. Ripgrep will actually give you syntax coloring. It'll show the line number 
that exists as well right here. And I would even highlight where the word shows up in the text. So I've been using RIPGREP a lot. Um, and it's up to you to kind of decide if you want to start with grep and kind of get used to grep and then jump onto rip grep, never touch rip grep. But I really enjoyed getting the supercharged version of it. And next we're going to cover input and output redirection. And this is actually one of the most common things um, I do on the command line. Um, and basically what it does is it allows you to take the output of a command and have it go elsewhere. Um, and it's for really useful when you want to save the output of a process or if you have a command to read from a file. So let's say, you know, um, in this example, I'm going to type ls to get all of the files in my and folders in my current directory. And I actually want to save it onto a text file where I just type ls greater than sign and then file list and it'll save it. So we can do that right here. and then cat file.txt, and it stored everything that I had from ls. You can see right here, everything's in that file. And then if you ever have a file and you want to send the contents of that file to another function like sort, you can use the less than sign. And so on this example, I have a command sort that'll sort all of the text in, uh, that I give it, and I'm gonna give it everything in file list.txt. So it's gonna take the contents of that file, send it to sort, and sort will work with it. So these are, these are, these are the main uses of these uh, greater than and less than signs. And for me, it's really useful to save logs from running processes, or you know, if I'm running tests, and I want to save the output and maybe share it with another engineer to kind of debug some things. So the example that I have here, go test dash v log file dot txt, it's going, that go test is actually what we use with the Golang language at DO. And it's actually going to take that test output and, and all the errors in it and save it in log file.txt. And then I can send that log file to whoever I want. Um, and so that's, uh, for me, one of the uses of input output redirection. If you have an existing file and you want to append something to it, then you can just do the two greater than signs. And that'll just do exactly kind of, uh, just append it to the end of the file. So I already showed you that I, had uh, this file.txt. Well, let's say I want to do that again. I'm going to append it. And so then if we look at file.txt, everything is just added at the bottom there. So I've just added extra, con extra stuff to the bottom of the file. Um, we've got a couple more slides um, to go. And um, I've we might run just a few minutes over, but I think we'll be okay. So next we have pipes. And pipes are represented with this straight um, line up character. And it's a, uh, one of the more powerful features of the command line. It essentially allows you to chain commands together to complete tasks by taking the output of one command and feeding it as input to a second command. And so basically you can just chain commands to do many things. So an example here is that I'm going to use cat to read a file. Then maybe I want to grep that file for some, everything that's HTTPS. That's just one reason of using, one way of using a pipe. It's um, another way is to actually, you know, maybe I want to copy something from a file. Then I can just cat that file and pipe it over to PB copy. So now I have the contents wherever I want it. So I have that file.txt. I'm going to send it to PB copy, and now it's there. Uh, doesn't seem like my terminal likes what I just did. Um, but anyway, um, the pipe is really a way to just chain commands and have them do custom tasks for you. Um, the Linux commands are great and they each do one thing really well, 
And sometimes you want to do a complex task. And the way you can do it is by just chaining several things together. So just always think about if you want to use a pipe, that you're taking the output of the left and you're sending it to the command on the right. All right. So we're going to go and finish off with just three last slides that are very practical, um, something that I think that a lot of you will enjoy using. So we're going to go over list pro listing processes and how to kill them. So um, no matter what you're doing, you're, there's always these processes running on your computer. And you can see them in your terminal by typing PSAUX and it's gonna show all the processes running on your computer. And then um, you can see kind of how you can identify them. So if I do PSX, it's gonna show every single process that's running on my computer. And you see there's a lot of them. <laughs> um, and many of these are just running in the background. You don't need to worry about them. But one thing you kind of see is there's all these uh, kind of information that it's giving you. It's giving you the CPU percentages taking up, the memory is taking up. And at the end of the day, there's not much here that you actually need to know. The one thing that is really nice to know, though, is PID. And the PID is a unique number to identify that process. Um, by the way, if you want to actually, this is so long, I could just take PS aux type it to grep, and I want to find uh, everything with associated to me. Uh, that came out a little weird. Hold on. Uh, let me see. All right, I'm not going to quite debug this because we're running out of time. Um, but anyway, um, the reason why I want to show you that is that every process is a PID number, and you can kill a process once you have that PID number. All you have to do is type kill dash nine and then the PID number. The reason why I bring this up is not because I think that you should go killing things manually all the time, but there'll be sometimes, and you'll face this in launch school, where you're going to have something crash. You're going to be working on a project. It's going to be running a web server, and the web server crashes, and you're like, okay, I'm going to try and restart it but for some reason it won't start properly. And the main reason why that is, is that it may have crashed, but there might be a process left over that you have to kill in order to get your server to run properly again. So that's how we can do that. We can PS aux, we can look for that um, process, and then we can kill it with dash nine. Um, I did this a lot when I was doing web development um, with Rails or even with Sinatra and for some reason something crashed and I had to kill the leftover process. Another way you can see your process is with this command lsoff and then these flags. And it gives you a little bit of a different output because it also shows the TCP and UDP ports. And these are useful for a different reason. So here you can see all the processes that are running on your computer and it'll show you the port numbers that they are using. Um, some of that may go over your head right now, but the new 170 networking course goes over port numbers really, really well, so you can get a firm idea of what it is. But the reason why I bring this up is that you, like I said, might be doing some web development, your server crashes, and you try having a hard time finding that, um, uh, that, that process well, maybe you remember what port it was listening on. Then you can find that port, and then you can kill it. So in this case, um, you know, we have here, I'm now looking for anything on this port 63558. Um, it doesn't quite show it. Let me see. Let me do something like this. Uh, mm. I just got a message that we're kind of running out of time. Um, sorry, this is taking a little longer than I intended. So I'm going to just um, leave this here. Um, and if you have questions, please message me. Um, but I'm going to try and get through my last two slides um, as soon as I can. All right. So the last two are some tools that I use every day. Um, and one of them is TMUX. 
And Tmux is a way of managing your terminal and giving you a whole bunch of flexibility. It's a terminal multiplexer that lets you basically have a Windows manager for your terminal. And it allows you to basically split screen your terminal and create all these windows that you can use. So um, because we're running out of time, I'm going to quickly just show you what that looks like. Um, we're going to, uh, so right now I've created a Tmux session. And in here, I can split screen. I can create split screens. And I can create another one. And so here, now I have four terminal windows that I can do all kinds of things uh, in them. And I can just hop over to different ones. And this really just lets me kind of do multiple things at a time in my terminal. Um, and the really great thing here is that I can do all of this. I can save this for a project I'm working on. And then I can pop out of it and I have back another window. And I can do a new one and it's completely different. And here I can be working on a different project, do all kinds of uh, different commands. And when I want to jump back to my other session, I can pop out, I can see my sessions, and I can jump onto one. Let's jump back to the one I had before. And everything is saved. Everything is just like it was before. So this is a really neat way of creating specific uh, layouts for projects and jumping back and forth. And so um, this one isn't too hard to pick up. Um, and I really recommend that if you don't have a big enough screen for everything you're doing, or if you want to kind of have this flexibility, then you give Tmux a try. And um, the one thing I do want to specify about Tmux is that you may have all these different sessions. And you may be doing all kinds of work. But I want you to remember is that if you're using Git and you're, um, and you're uh, working on different projects, no matter which session you hop onto, which layout, you're going to be in the same Git branch. So the reason why I point that out is that I don't want you to have a few projects, you use Tmux, you create a different session, some layouts for a project, you hop over to another project, you're changing code, you're saving code, you're pushing it to GitHub, and then you realize you are on the wrong branch. So just to remember is that Tmux is great, Tmux is awesome for um, jumping to and from different layouts, for working on all kinds of things. But always check your Git branch, where you're on, and that you're the, on the branch you want to be on when you're using Tmux. Um, so that's just a little word of caution. Um, there's instructions here if you want to install Tmux. Um, and um, you know, just try it out. So lastly, I'm going to try and give a very brief intro to Vim. And OK, so I've just been told that the presentation will continue past the hour. So um, I'm going to be around to kind of go over anything that maybe I zipped past too quickly. Um, so sorry if I kind of zipped through. But if you want me to go over something in a little more through detail, we can do that after I finish this last slide. But let's just talk about Vim. So Vim is a text editor that runs in your shell. And Vim is a powerful text editor. And it allows you to quickly find, edit, and delete text. And you're doing everything on your keyboard. If you are using Vim the way you should be, you should never use your mouse at all. Um, the way that Vim kind of lets you navigate is with the J, K, um, L, and H keys, just going up, down, and around. Kind of like you know, just computer games. You know, just using those keys to move around. Um, Vim is great as well because you can also execute terminal commands inside of Vim. So it keeps you kind of uh, like in the same flow from editing text and 
um, executing code and so forth. Um, Vim has a bit of a learning curve, but there's a huge payoff to it and it's insanely customizable. Um, and just like we talked about before about modifying your bash shell with the dot bash profile, um, dot file, you can customize your Vim with a dot file. So let me give you a show. I've been using Vim throughout this presentation to show you files just out of habit. Um, but kind of let me show you what I'm talking about. So let us go into the Sinatra repo and let us dive in. There we go. And we can just go to main.rb. Oh, whoops, I misspelled that. Uh, and here we are. And you know, with Vim, I can jump to the end of the file. I can jump to the top of the file. I can um, search for um, words. And then I can hop to any other um, instances. So if I want to jump to that class, I can go here and start editing. Um, and you can do um, you know, just regular editing. So I can delete this line and I can you know, require something, uh, hold on, uh, some other uh, um, thing. Um, I'm just kind of jumping around. Um, or, you know, you can start editing all kinds of things more quickly. So with Vim, if I just want to maybe edit the string in these quotes, I can just completely delete everything in there in just a few keystrokes and just start typing away on what I want in there. Um, I can also hop between cursors. I'm sorry, um, parentheses. I can just in a few keystrokes delete everything inside. I can even delete everything in between these curly braces, just like that. I can undo it. Um, and it allows you to just really quickly edit text. And you just get really used to it with the ability to just handle all these kind of large scale edits very, very quickly. Um, another example is kind of, you know, in uh, this file, maybe I, you know, I'm at the beginning of this line and I want to jump all the way to editing that equals equals, I can just type F equals and I'm already there. It jumped me right there. The thing about Vim is that it has all these capabilities to quickly just jump your cursor to where you need to be. Um, and, you know, I can just um, jump to that comment. I can delete that comment. Maybe I want to go up here and now I'm just going to hit one button and I've pasted it over there. So with Vim, um, it's this powerful um, editor it does take a little bit of a learning curve because you kind of have to just work these commands into your muscle memory. Um, with Vim, you can do a split. And so now I have the same file in split screen. Um, I can choose to edit a different file and hop into, let's say, show exceptions. And I can hop between uh, the two of them. I can you know, grab something from here. I want to get rid of this comment. I hop over to the left and I'm gonna paste that over here. And maybe I wanted to, um, I don't wanna do that split screen, I can do this. And now I can grab this and now I'm up and down split screen and I can start editing text this way. Um, maybe I'm in the middle of this file and I'm like, oh yeah, I wanna go check that other, um, I wanna run a terminal command. Well, I can just, at the very bottom of the screen, you can see that I'm just typing a few characters and I'm typing a terminal command and it'll execute it in the terminal and I can see what it executes and I'm back inside my Vim. The cool thing is um, I like to use Vim and Tmux at the same time. So if you go to here, I'm, in Tmux, I have everything split screen. Um, let me actually.
close these out. Okay, so we're just in a, I've just used Tmux, I've created a session. And let's say I wanna jump into Sinatra. I'm gonna jump into my lib folder. I wanna jump into Sinatra. And I want to um, look at the uh, main.rb file. And I'm in here again. Let's open a, uh, another split screen with Tmux. So now I'm in this terminal here on my right. And maybe I want to uh, jump into Sinatra again, jump into live, jump into Sinatra. Uh, and I want to just look at uh, uh, that, uh, this use less to look at this file. And then I'm looking at this file just to reference it. I can hop over, I can hop over back to Vim and edit. And this is kind of what my desktop screen is like all day at DigitalOcean. I have Vim on one side, and I've used Tmux to open another uh, kind of screen, and I'm referencing files, I'm searching with grep, I'm doing all kinds of things. And this is kind of just how I've optimized my workflow. So that was a quick intro to Vim. Um, I don't think I quite did it justice. I kind of thought that I would have, uh, I would, um, I kind of, ran out of time sooner than I did. Um, but I wanted to leave time for questions, um, especially since I see some people leaving the presentation right now. Um, so I'm going to finish by just saying there are resources here at the end of the presentation I've linked um, to uh, linuxcommand.org, which will give you um, tutorials on a lot of these commands, gives you a chance to work more deeply on them. Um, it also has a free PDF of the Linux command line book for you to learn more deeply. Um, it has uh, a thing titled Adventures, which is just uh, deeper dives into specific topics like Vim, like Tmux. Um, at any time, if you want to learn more about a command, then I really suggest you use the man pages. And every command has a man page. So, um, you know, all these commands I've been using, you can just type man grep and you can see everything there is to know about grep. You can see all of the flags, all of the um, options. It's a really great way to just, you know, learn a little bit more about um, the command. Um, so be sure to give those a look. Um, and that's what I've got for you. So thank you for sitting here with me and, you know, um, allowing me to talk about all these commands and all these options. I know that was a lot of information. Um, and I kind of sped through a few of them, but I'm open to questions now. Um, and let me see, there's already a couple. All right, you're welcome, you're welcome. Um, Brian asks, would you be willing to make these slides available in a PDF or the Launch School website? Yes, I'll make these, um, if it's totally okay and I've done it before, I'm gonna post these slides um, in the Launch School Slack um, so you all can see them. Um, and uh, you can have access to all these links. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, like I said, I'll post these soon and you all have a good night.